So uh, this is now uh, our second, well, it's our first season of the book club, our, our second quarter and our second book of the quarter. So we are at uh, November of uh, 2023 and uh, the second month of the winter quarter. And uh, we have to this evening, Jack Bales uh, doing our moderation of our of, of the book, uh, The Beer and Whiskey League, uh, by David Nemec, with some photos by Mark Rucker. And uh, this is truly uh, another uh, staple, in a sense, of a 19th century baseball historian's uh, should be, I guess, on everybody's library. <laughs> so it's, it is a book that is very uh, uh, valuable in terms of getting to understand the uh, uh, 19th century baseball and uh, the 12 years or so, or, the, or 11 years that the American Association was in existence. Uh, I want to mention that uh, this 19th century committee had a project underway uh, called the American Association Project, which was a team by team um, study of all the teams that were in the association uh, by city, and uh, and a lot of progress was made on that, but it was terribly stalled, and uh, it was always a painful experience at the uh, 19th century committee meetings in the early 20th century, at least. Uh, when uh, we'd say, well, uh, at the time, uh, the, the chairman would say, well, what's the status on the, uh, on the book, on the project, the American Association project? And it was some guys had did wonderful work, some guys hadn't done their work, and so forth and so on. So David Nemec, in the meanwhile, uh, wrote this book. <laughs> yeah. he, he did it single-handedly. It was only David can, I think. And... Uh, he wrote this wonderful book about the American Association, and that uh, that book, in a sense, was our justification to, as John Thorne had put it, the project is more bond, <laughs> it was dying. So uh, we did stop the project, and uh, it took quite a few years, a couple of years at least, but Joanne Holbert was insistent that we save all of the notes and we were able to retrieve through Joanne's efforts the original notes that all of those individuals in the 19th century committee had uh, taken uh, on their respective teams. And those notes were then subsequently uh, put into the Sabre uh, research files. So uh, once in a while I'll get an email saying, uh, do we have any information about the American Association? And he says, oh, yes, we do. And uh, <laughs> just go to this spot on the Sabre website, and you can find it. But in the meanwhile, David Nemec did his wonderful job with the Beer and Whiskey League. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to Jack Bales. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, as, as, Peter, as Peter said, uh, I had the same reaction. This book just kind of blew me away. You know, I, I didn't had not I had it, but I had not read it until I was working on this project. And I think it's very difficult to uh, to relate a season by season baseball narrative that is that is just sharp and interesting and and and, and vibrant. But but David Nemec does this, and it's just not a step by step chronicle. But I kept thinking to myself when I was reading it, this is a real good story too. It's just a, a real good story, and I noticed at the end of each chapter there's kind of like a cliffhanger that he leads into the, the to the next chapter uh and and the photographs i mean my god the photographs have these amazing captions uh that just that blew me away too i mean there's stories in the captions like uh one of my favorite ones was he was talking about a louisville pitcher scott stratton who was 313 in 1889 but then got married and got 34 wins the next year and nemec wrote that quote conjugal life seemed to revitalize him you know i mean what a what a great what a great line and it's in a and it's in a photo caption and then there was uh the last surviving member of 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 the american association was william hoy who was i guess a deaf mute 
but he said that an umpire heard him say after he got tagged too rather hard. He says, "You know, why do you have to hit? Why do you have to hit me?" Even though th th this Willie Hoy denied it all his life that he actually said that, but this umpire, you know, swears he did. But uh, yeah, this guy, did, yeah. yeah, but it's got a, a great lines, great stories, great anecdotes, and and really captivating writing. Is anybody, else, every people, any of you pick that up too as well? Uh, was just how just how good it was. Yeah, anyone. Yeah, it was a great picture in, I think, 1883, where they had, like, the scoreboard, and it showed, like, the yeah. other six teams and uh, advertisements and, 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 like, a couple of teams. Uh, that was a pretty amazing photograph. Yeah. I just I just, I just read the, the photographs captivated me as much as uh, the, yeah. uh, <laughs> everything else. Yeah. Uh, and there are also all these dramatic stories, too. Like, uh, St. Louis's 1886 win was one of my favorites. So you got Cap Anson trying to sneak in pitcher Mark Baldwin, which didn't work. Uh, he had been signed just a couple of days before the championship season started. And I guess uh, Cap Anson and uh, 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 Bander Haje, I guess that's how you pronounce it. Um, Ahe, I think Ahe. Ahe, okay, Bander Ahe. I think so. I'm not sure. <laughs> Accent on the first syllable. Okay, Ahe, that sounds good. Uh, uh, they didn't get along too well anyway, I, 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 I don't think. And then they got Kurt Welch with his $15,000 fly, which was really, according to David Nemec, $13,920. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> you got Cap Anson blaming everybody else except for himself. Of course, uh, when that when Chicago didn't win, and I don't know if you know this, but I, and I'm not sure if David mentioned this, but uh, in, in my Cubs research, I, I discovered that you know Cap Anson was originally called Baby because of his youth, but gradually, as the seasons wore on, he was called Baby because of all his kicking and, and complaining, uh, and and this was pointed out. During this during during, the, during this 1886 win, uh, and I only wish that there were more anecdotes about Cap Anson because he's one of those players you kind of love to hate because it was all the, of the way he he managed his team sometime and and some of his antics. Uh, but anyway, it is racism, racism too. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, Okay, now let me. I have some questions, some things I want to cover. Although the American Association did not last long, of course, it stood up very well by itself, uh, or for itself. It cut admission, they played games on Sundays, and they sold liquor in the ballparks. And now I noticed that the National League complained that they grabbed players from their teams, uh, that the AA grabbed grab players from the National League teams that had already been signed. And the National League kept on complaining about this. But, you know, wasn't this something like turnabout is fair play? Because it, I thought the National League, you know, uh, certainly did not, did not take the high road when it came to, you know, grabbing other players that had been signed. I think in, in 81, the Detroit, Detroit Wolverines took a player that had already been signed to the Philadelphia Athletics. So, you know, I don't know, did anybody notice this? You know, why was the National League complaining about the American Association when, when the National League was doing exactly the same thing? Because they could. Because they could, <laughs> right? Yeah, they were the big boys. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's uh, a good. I, your your comment there is is, is the right one. Yeah. National League saw themselves as the the pinnacle of the pyramid, mm -hmm. and whatever they did was de facto the correct thing to do in their best interest. There's been plenty of articles written how the National League always acted in their own individual oh, really? yeah best okay. best interest. <laughs> Uh, particularly when you see uh, uh, Spalding and Sodden and, and uh, uh, Rogers and, and whatnot, just didn't care. Uh, they would justify it. Uh, Holbert was was as bad. He he wanted to stop stealing players from the team, but that's how he founded his team in the National. That's right. You sure did. Yeah, yeah. And I think National League players, some of them jumped to the Union Association. It was that in '84? You know, so uh, uh, so they were doing it too. Yeah. Okay. That is oh. the uh, reserve system. The National League may have been considering a reserve player the same as a assigned player. And of course, the players wouldn't view it. Oh, like okay. I did not know that. Yeah. There. That's a good point. I did not know that. Okay. Um, and similarly, I, I know in the beginning, the American Association said it wouldn't sign, it wouldn't hire National League blacklisted players but then it recanted it did and didn't the national league they they hired 
they they signed blacklisted players and weren't there degrees of blacklistedness shall we say like there was like alcohol i don't think was all that bad but maybe some of the national league you know uh teams thought it was pretty bad uh but uh but but the national league they signed blacklisted players just as much as the american association did did they anybody know that okay Anyway, okay. Uh, I got the impression that the American Association should have played hardball occasionally. Um, uh, Washington promoter Mike Scanlon suggested that the American Association sign players who had been blacklisted for minor offenses, regardless of what the National League said about threatening to ostracize the new league. But when the American Association was not willing to do that, Scanlon changed his mind about trying to get a Washington team into the American Association. I mean, did the American Association, did they did they bow it down? Did they kind of wuss out, so to speak, in, in this respect or in other respects, too? Again, maybe the National League with, with the big boys here. Uh, I t I had, my takeaway from the, I read the book also, my takeaway is there was too much infighting instead of protecting each other and, and uniting uh, against a kind of enemy, a, a common enemy, the National League, they were uh, infighting with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, like, like when teams are in trouble, they would pounce on them and uh, buy their players and make the other teams fold. Rather than unite and help each other out, they fought with each other, and that's what led to their ultimate demise. Yeah, okay. That's what I get out of it. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm. I, I think the National League uh, certainly did hang together, but that was their whole purpose. When you look at their constitution in 1876, the, their goal was to control professional baseball in the United States. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so the whole idea that they had was that, that they were in charge. And I do think that, I think, Jack, I think you're right that they ran roughshod over the American Association. But an awful lot of the American Association was not well capitalized, and they couldn't compete for the players in the same way that the National League mm -hmm. could do. And the National League was always setting the rules through the national agreement. The, oh, yeah. the Board of Arbitration, you know, was uh, may have had equal number of, of, of uh, league representatives, but the National League, we are, the National League always had. A friendly American Association person mm, there. Okay. Uh, Bob, you mentioned the uh, the National Agreement, and I know David. There, there were a couple of National Agreements that were were ironed out during during the tenure of the American Association. I don't think David Nemec mentions this, but the, were these always at the instigation of the National League to try to make things better for themselves and kind of like get the a, American Association to kind of go along with them? I, probably. <laughs> But there, every time you turn around, it seemed there was a new, well, not, not that much, but there were at least, I think, two national agreements that came about during those 10 years. Well, pe people say there's different national agreements. Those are major rewrites. Every year there were changes. Okay. Uh, yeah. There, there was some, some sort of, of modification. Most of it was to control the players through contracts, the reserve system, what you blacklisting and all those sort of things but they also had them watch themselves and put rules in and said you can't do this anymore because it hurts the overall organization mm -hmm. okay. but but it was always the, the american association complained an awful lot about stealing players dates and scheduling and, and various as the national group moved closer to 1890 uh, but the National League, they weren't going to give on any point. I, uh, if they did give on a point, it was always something minor, and they always took something major back for it. Yeah, okay. Well, David Nemec writes that the Indianapolis Club directors asserted, with some justification, I guess, that the, the American Association was secretly run by the big three. You got you got Opie Kaler of Cincinnati, uh, and and, and uh, Chris Bandrahe of St. Louis, and Lou Simmons of Philadelphia. And they he said they cared only, only about their own selfish interests. And I was wondering. Was that really, really true? I, I, I don't even know much about Lou Simmons. Was a completely new name, name, name to me. But I know uh, the St. Louis, you know, Bonder Hahe, 
you know, God, I, I love, I think David says that one person said that you either hated him or you detested him, you know, uh, <laughs> you know we thought that was a great line. Uh, and I knew from my, from my Cubs research that, you know, that uh, he, he, ran roughshod over a lot of people, but, but I'm not sure about the other. I think Opie Kaler, you know, I think David Nemec says that he's supposed to be in the background at first, but then he didn't not get out of the background. Then he got more and more in the forefront and he finally quit the quit baseball was fed up with baseball and kind of like went into business or something like that. But uh, no, did they try to run, run everything? Uh, yeah, there was a lot of infighting uh, amongst yeah. the owners, and I say that's what ultimately did them in. Yeah. Instead of presenting a united front against the National League, they constantly fought uh, too much infighting, and yeah. the National League uh, took advantage of that and pounced on it. Yeah. And that led to their ultimate demise. That's what I got out of the book. Yeah. I read something in the book that was supposed to be like a... a Three people, one uh, representing the uh, National League, one representing the American Association, and a third neutral party. And it was an argument over a contract, and a guy from the American Association actually voted with the National League. And then they suspected Al Spaulding planted him in there. Uh... <laughs> oh, uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, who heard of that? I mean, that, that's yeah. ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It's laughable, but uh, supposedly true. That's what David Nemec said. The guy from the National uh, American Association sided with the National League on this guy's contract. I don't remember who the player was. Mm-hmm. The fact that he would side with the National League, yeah. supposed to be signing with your own league, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was really weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, but uh, I was saying, too, much, too much infighting, though. They didn't. They, they uh, cannibalized each other. One team was in trouble. They would pounce. They would buy their players at buy and sell prices and make these teams go out of business. And then they would have to scramble to get new franchises. What? So they'd present the United Front against the National League. They kept them fighting with each other. Yeah, I, th- I think that was just a, a, a little bit backwards because as teams would get weaker, they would cannibalize them. Uh, yeah, so, they would cannibalize them. But, yeah. but they yeah. were already getting ready to drop out of the league, most, most cases. Uh, take a look at eight, 1884 uh, uh, when the Union Association, the Association comes yeah. up. The uh, uh, National League convinced the American Association somehow to add four teams. Mm-hmm. So they had 12 teams and National League kept eight. <laughs> and oh, they got yeah. some weak sisters in there. Weak sisters, oh, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. You're bad about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, Nevik says that uh, the American Association was really done for being indecisive. And, and Dennis. Mc, Denny McKnight, I think, was kind of criticized for being rather indecisive as well, and that kind of led, led to the demise uh, uh, later on. Um, there, there was one thing I got kind of confused on. I really tried to figure this out, and it was what led to De- Denny McKnight's ouster as president. Uh, I guess it was 86. And there was that one player named Sam Barkley in, in 80, 86, and he wanted to be traded, so the Browns owner let both Pittsburgh and Baltimore know that he'd be available for a $1,000. And, and Barkley made a verbal commitment to Pittsburgh. But Billy Barney, the manager of the Orioles, had Barkley sign an undated contract. And he, Barney, sent the Browns owner $1,000. But he was late with the money. And 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 the, and Vanderhahe got impatient. So he accepted Pittsburgh's offer and released Barkley to Pittsburgh. And so the Orioles appealed to the American Association and presided over by McKnight, who did not vote due to a conflict of interest. Uh, but the board suspended Barkley for all of 86 and fined him. And Barkley sued the association and the suspension was lifted, but the fine and stayed. And so then I guess McKnight was was charged with trying to influence Barkley to break the arrangement with Baltimore. And and then I, and I thought Barkley was just stuck in the whole middle with this. And I don't think he did anything wrong. And I thought the fine was a bit harsh, you know. <laughs> but 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 I guess that's what cost McKnight his job was this whole thing with the with uh with with Barkley. Well that that similar thing in, in eighteen ninety one with uh, uh Beer Bauer and Stovey. Uh, oh, that's right. Yes. Uh-huh. That war, and it wasn't until that, and that 
the National League had a whole lot more money to, to survive that that uh, uh, period and were ruthless about dropping salaries once the Players League was, mm-hmm. was, was gone. And the American Association was too, but they didn't have the quality of players to start with. And the next thing you know, there's a new national agreement and half the American Association is gone and half the in the National League. Yeah. Yeah, um, the National League is spanned from eight teams to 12 teams in 1892. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of the teams, uh, Nemec noted that John Day owned both the American Association both uh, and the National League New York teams. And I guess Charlie Byrne owned both the Mets and the Brooklyn. And I guess other owners had stock in, in more than one team. And and, and he, David does not go into this, but I was wondering if there was any conflict of interest with them owning stock in both in, 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 in both leagues. I guess there was this example with, with Denny McKnight and everything. Uh, but I don't know, was there ever any other conflict of interest or any, you know, dark, you know, smoke-filled boom shenanigans going on. I, I did not know of any in the – pick up any in the book anyway. Peter may have some some insight into Jim Mutry and – Oh, yeah. The, the yeah. Mets <laughs> and the Giants. Yeah. yeah uh, a lot of the, the players the Metropolitan yeah, Metropolitan went over to the Giants in 83. Yeah. So the story goes that the um, – Holbert died in 1882. 82, yeah. Uh-huh. And Holbert uh, had denied admission of any New York team or Philadelphia team to the National League right. uh, all the way up until that, that point. And uh, finally, in 1882, uh, he didn't make an offer to the Metropolitans uh, to take their independent team which was part of the National Association agreement, by the way. It was part of the National League's agreement. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did invite them to put a team uh, into the National League. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, The American American Association approached uh, uh, the Metropolitans. But the Metropolitans were already... Uh, in league with the National League, in, they were an independent team, but they had a, uh, they were part of the national agreement. So that allowed National League teams to play in the nation's largest city. Mm-hmm. So it was really uh, great paydays back in the early 80s, uh, with Mutri and Day of the Metropolitan owners, or Day was technically the owner, uh, to stay in this agreement with the National League. Uh, Bob Warrington gave a presentation at one of the Philadelphia Sabre meetings a couple of years ago uh, about the uh, the formation of the Phillies uh, becoming a, uh, uh, having an American association team in Philadelphia. And what was, he, he reports that what was said was that Holbert was dying, and that by 1883, the Phillies would be admitted to the American Association. And uh, uh, actually, Holbert died in April of uh, 1882. So uh, there's this whole uh, uniqueness about this Philadelphia and New York teams uh, becoming members of both the American Association and later the, and the National League. Because they were America's first and second largest cities at the time in the, in the 19th century at that time. So uh, uh, there's that kind of backdrop there. There was always this exception for New York and for Philadelphia to some degree, because those two cities were visiting teams coming from smaller cities or coming from the West or making a road trip to the East. It was always a payday in New York and Philadelphia for them. And uh, that's why the American Association was so flexible. Um, and uh, there was Mutri's abandonment of the Metropolitan, as Metropolitan manager to take over after the 1884 season to take over the New York Giants, the other team that he and they owned. 
uh, almost broke this national agreement, put a lot of tension, uh, attention on it. But there was still too much money to be made in those cities to make much of a, a beef about it. So uh, they kind of overlooked it. Uh, Peter, Peter, when you say you to took you? over for the Giants, uh, New York Giants, 1885? I'm sorry, say that again. When did Jim Mucci become manager of the New York National League Giants? Well, the Gotham's. He manager in uh, April Gotham, of uh, yeah. 1885, and he took. Oh, I thought he took over right away in '83. Okay, I was no, wrong. no, he t and he took over. He took over their two of their key players. He hmm. took them from the Metropolitan as well. What were thought to be well, one was a, a legitimate Hall of Famer, and uh, Tim Keefe was a pitcher. Yeah. And uh, he did to also take over, bring over Dude Estabrook, who at the time was erroneously reported to have the highest batting average in the American Association, which, by the way, took almost over 100 years to correct. <laughs> Peter, do, is this familiar to you with uh, when they made the player transfer? There were some shenanigans of getting these players on a boat or something kind of. Yeah, that was out of that town where they couldn't be. I, I, and you know, this goes back. I, I learned all this when I was doing polo grounds research. I was more interested in the polo grounds than the players. But yeah, that that hit me that Keith was one of them, and really had to do some some wild shenanigans to do it. Yeah. So 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 mutually put Keith and uh, and Estabrook on a tour, a ten day cruise to Bahamas. Oh. I mean to uh, uh, Bermuda, and. Uh, because at the at the time they could they were free agents like for almost, for ten days like another team could ten sign. days yeah right so he wanted to get them out of reach of any other team but in Mutri doing that he was an American Association manager at the time he did that and when he came back he just stepped into the role as the Giants manager so there was a firestorm there uh, during that that moment. Uh, that lasted for a few months, uh, and that's the same year the Giants, by the way, got their nickname Giants. Hmm. So, who okay. was the manager of the of the uh, of the uh, Gotham's in '83 and '84? I'm sorry, say it again. Who was the manager of the New York team in '83 and '84? Mutri. I'm talking about the National are you League. Talking team? about? Are you talking about the Giants? The Giants, yeah, yeah, oh, eighty-eight, eighty-four, um, the National I League. I have it off the tip of my head. <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought Mutual um, took over in eighty-three. Okay, so I was wrong. Yeah, Mutual took over in eighty-five. All right, my my mistake. It's <laughs> all right. Uh, in eighteen ninety, the bridegrooms, the Brooklyn bridegrooms of the National League, and the Louisville and the, and the American Association were playing for the World Series, and, and this. I've always wondered about this this topic I'm going to get into. And this is the, the best five of nine games. Uh, the weather was turning bad in November, the series in November, and the series was tied at three and three. And both teams decided to call it a draw. Uh, gate receipts were meager, and both the uh, National League and the American Association were quarreling. Uh, Brooklyn probably did not take the series seriously, according to what David Nemec was saying, because they were a much better team and they should have beaten Louisville. And Nemec writes, quote, indeed, the evidence strongly suggests that the players were never highly motivated for any of the postseason affairs in the last century. And when I was doing my Cubs research, I remember some time ago, I, I read an article in 1885 Sporting Life, wrote that the games, quote, amount to nothing financially as they are recognized as exhibition games and but slimly patronized, especially as the interest in baseball games ends with the championship season. Was this for a very long time, to, uh, like from the very beginning, uh, when they first started having the championship games till, you know, maybe the turn of the century? Uh, I, I don't know. Was, Peter? Yeah, I see you're nodding your head there. I just, I just yeah. glanced down at the chat. Yes, it's oh, too Stuart yeah. only reminded me it's John Clapp, who uh -huh. was one of the major managers of the National League Giants, and he's correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do I say that again? Oh, sorry, Jack. You said you, your question was. Oh, about was it, was this lack of motivation in the championship series? Did that go on for for a long time in the 19th century? 
Uh, it was mentioned heavily in this eight in eighteen ninety, I guess, when I first came across. Not eighteen ninety, yeah, eighteen ninety, I think, yeah. And then so, Sporting Life mentioned it in eighty five too. Yeah, I think uh, one of the problems they had early on was this belief that these World Series, nine game World Series, and so forth, you know, those long World Series, uh, should be played in neutral cities. Or at least some of the games played in neutral cities. Yeah, and I think that that took a lot of steam out of uh, that, you know, championship series at the end of the year. Yeah, uh, certainly when Mutri and um, Frank Bancroft of the uh, Providence Grays of the National League decided to play the World Series of 1884, you know, quote the first, even though there was a. Uh, in 83, there was also kind of postseason play. But in 1884, they, 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 uh, they used the term World Championship Series. And so they decided to make it three games. And, and Frank Bancroft had no problem to have all three games played in New York City, mm -hmm. not Providence, Rhode Island. And why do you think? Because well, they well, perceived that the gate. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Has been so much uh, more right. potential. Wasn't and the 84 uh, postseason a best of five, but Providence won the first three games and therefore it was over because they swept? I'm sorry, say it again, Max. <clears throat> now I'm saying the 84 World Series or postseason, wasn't it supposed to be a best of five? But no, it was just the best of three. Won the first three games and therefore it was over? Yeah, it was the best of three. But what happened was the Providence oh. team actually won decisively. Actually, Hoss Radborn, you know, after his uh, wonderful 84 season. Yeah, he uh, all, he three games, yeah. all three games. And uh, yeah. the Giants had to beg Frank Bancroft uh, that to not to pull the team out of, t out of New York uh, because uh, they had, you know, yeah. done things for Bancroft in the past. And mm -hmm. Uh, so Bancroft agreed to play Game Three, although uh, mm. it was it was already a determined World Series no, play. So it was that's two out of three. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now I thought it was a, I thought it was a best of five, and uh, being that Province won the first no, three, the best of three. And, best uh, of three. Okay. and by the way, they had this wonderful parade the night before. The weather was warm. It was a tor torch lit parade. Uh, they thought it was going to be a wonderful World Series. And the following day, the weather just plummeted in temperature and uh, it freezing rain. And uh, that's what the three days amounted to. Uh, a very t terrible turnout. The 1890 series had another particular problem, by the way, and that was that the Players League had all the star power. And in many oh. cities, the Players League was the was the was the better attended team so it may have been seen as an exercise in futility to have a national league american association championship at the time that's right ron and I think, yeah it's 1890 and uh yeah this all the stars were in the players league and the players league did dominate you know uh if you, if you had to add it up it dominated uh, those other two leagues just in terms of attendance throughout the season and when it came to the end, it was a very uh, sketchy uh, thing about having a, a World Series at all that involved uh, anything but the players. Well, another thing, it seems like uh, all these World Series games were ad hoc arrangements between the championship right. clubs themselves rather than an official arrangement between the two leagues, which sort of makes it seem kind of I don't know, flimsy or something. That might have been a problem in terms of people taking it seriously. Yeah, because oh, some of them were like three game or three games or, or fifteen yeah. games or whatever. Yeah, you know, it was yeah. fifteen games. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, certainly there was certainly there was no format that was set on yeah. those things. Even even in the twentieth century, the format didn't move that much, seven games or nine games, but it was always all at home. And it was just the travel schedule that, that tended to, to move back and forth. But if you take a look at the, the 19th century, Woody's exactly right. It was the teams that thought they were going to win would make a deal 
with the other team that thought they were going to win, and they would try to get the uh, a, a series set up, and they would talk about what players were eligible because guys would try to sign ringers. There was all sorts of things about how they're going to divide the gate receipts, who gets what, what would the players get because their contr- some of them their contracts ran until November first, some of them ended October first. They had their own difficulties trying or October fifteenth. So they had some some difficulties, but it wasn't until 1905 that we started to get the brush rules and we started to see the World Series being formally set. And what we see it today was evolved to today. I think the 03 World Series was the only one that was best of nine, right? No, they had best of nine in the late teens. They wanted extra games to make more money in the the war years, and they oh, lasted they? and oh. they into the early 20s. Really? Yeah. Huh. Okay. Didn't know that. <laughs> you mentioned this, uh, the gate receipts, Bob. I did not know until I read this book that that was changing all the time. I think, in, and he mentioned that, you know, they had another agreement that I think was 20% of the gate, the visiting team. And then one time it was 25. I thought it had always been set pretty much for years and years, but it, it, it was a, it was a fluid, fluid thing, I think, I guess. Division of Great Receipt went beyond the World Series. Yeah. There was there was disagreement. Should you get a flat rate, you know, yes. sixty five, one hundred fifty dollars, uh-huh. whatever it be, yeah. if you for the visiting game, or should they get thirty percent of the of of the gate? The big teams wanted to give a guarantee, and the little teams wanted a percentage of the gate because they were always going to a, a larger city. Mm-hmm. But the the in the uh, World Series sort of thing, they were kind of flying by the seat of their pants. They just made up the rules as they go along, and it was between the owners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I remember David Nemec saying that uh, because of the admission fees, I think uh, it could be be changed between the cities that uh, the teams would, would move the locations of their games to a city that would give them more money. Uh, and that was something new, new for me too that I, I did not know before. Um, um. Yeah, in terms of that eighteen ninety season in Pittsburgh, um, the American Association team only drew sixteen thousand over the entire season, whereas the Players League uh, team in the same city drew over a hundred thousand the same season and um the the american associations team uh, uh, american association team in pittsburgh actually just stopped playing home games because uh teams would didn't want to go to pittsburgh where the draw was so low oh mm-hmm. yeah wow. and that was a regular happening with weak sister teams particularly in the uh the big in the 1890s when teams would really get bad they'd I think Cleveland did it for a while. I know Louisville did it for several seasons where they would just, the ballpark would burn down and they'd go on the road or they'd just say, I can't make any money here. And they would get an agreement with the uh, uh, team that was coming to their town and say, we'll come to your town. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, in, in 1891, there was a big controversy about the pennant. You know, Boston went on an 18-game winning streak, though some sports writers said that the National League wanted to keep the pennant in the East and not let it go to Chicago, and that some teams, especially the Giants, were letting Boston win. And the Giants, for example, did not use several of their star players. And uh, I had looked into this some time ago from, from, from when I was doing my, my Cubs research, uh, Chicago research and some I found out that some sports fighters insinuated that the players dislike for Cap Anson had something to do with it, and also he disliked that he hated the Players League, and Players League members were were on some of these team uh, were on some of these teams. They did not want to get uh, Cap Anson and the Chicago to win. Uh, but many publications, though, I found out said that there was absolutely no subterfuge about any of this, and one of them pointed out that that Chicago struggled during the last two weeks of the season and that perhaps what they 
what had hurt them more in the baseball pennant race were the games that they had lost rather than the contests that their opponents had won. And this was very, very controversial. And I, and I read a lot of the contemporary articles and one said one thing and one said the other. Does anybody have any thoughts about, you know, was there a subterfuge about this or was it just a, just a, just the way it all played out and that Cap Anson was just blowing smoke as he often did? Well, there was some uh, ev there was some uh, speculation that the Giants uh, deliberately used the withheld their star players so uh, they would uh, in, in order to help uh, them beat Chicago, so, uh, you know, the, their opponents uh, would uh, overtake Chicago. Yeah. So uh, there, there is some. I think there might be some truth to that. Yeah. that the Giants would deliberately uh, you not use their star players. Uh, so they would be so other teams would win and again knock Chicago out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I had read that, so I think it may be some truth there because he would because Cap Anson was so hated that right. uh, there could be some truth to it. Yeah, and that but was my take we'll never too. Know for sure. But Cap Anson was just so hated all the time. He's such a dick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh David says in his prologue, and this is something that really interested me from my, my research on Halbert especially, in his prologue that the two leagues would coexist, but there would always be an undercurrent of distrust and hostility, even if it seemed amicable on the surface. And, and this really hit home with me because, you know, I've gone through a lot of Halbert's letters at the Chicago History Museum, and here he is all buddy-buddy with, with Denny McKnight of the Alleghenies, and also Walter Appleton of the Metropolitans. So, of course, he doesn't really mince words. In late 1881, he writes McKnight that he says, quote, many of the ideas upon which your association is based, such as beer, Sunday games, a varied tariff for admission to championship games, are each and all the rankest fallacies. Each and every departure that I name lowers the tone. You cannot afford that. You cannot afford to bid for the patronage of the degraded. And, and this is a line from something we talked about last month with Bill Rysak's book, that the teams charged admission and they built fences in part to keep the riffraff out that, that Hubbard was talking about. And Hubbard says, if you are to be successful, you must secure recognition by the respectable. A Sunday playing club that is at the same time accessory to beer hawking, he says, is beyond doubt a curse to any community. And he writes, which I've always wondered about if this is really true. He says, quote, speaking for myself as a member of the of the Chicago club and the league, I've not the slightest feeling antagonistic to the American Association. I sincerely wish you had adopted every arbitrary picture of the National League. As organized, I cannot believe your association will live long or that it could be anything but in, in a harmonious. And he also writes, you speak of an inclination to visit me. I shall be happy to see you at any time. The fact that we differ as to the proper method for conducting business organizations shall not prevent harmony if I am contact, contacted. Again, I wonder if you just again, blowing smoke here or if we did have any real feelings of harmony toward McKnight, toward the American Association, because I've always thought that the, the Halbert had feelings of harmony for himself. And that was pretty much it. You know, we'd throw anybody under the bus. But uh, but was there this level of distrust between, well, I guess there had to be, between the National League and, or was there a level of amicability on the surface, but always this level of, hey, we're the National League, we're the big boys, we're the ones who are going to push you out eventually. You're muted, Peter. My daughter's dog was barking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, um, if you look at the expansion of the reserve clause, uh, that, uh, I think it was in 1879, it was first, like, you know, they, they were managed to, uh, National League clubs were allowed to reserve uh, five players, I believe it was. Yeah, and that so that crept up in the beginning, particularly I think where the real distrust, you know, lie was in the uh, 
it was the signing of players. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the real distrust was, uh, particularly the first year of the American Association, because they did raid and sign anybody that they could from the National League. And, uh, you know, they were making these deals to do it. Uh, the peace was made, the peace was made because in 1883, uh, uh, they made an agreement that they wouldn't do that. Uh, they, they wouldn't raid each, each other's teams. And I think that's where the mistrust lie. Of course, the American Association was boasting of doing everything that Holbert was boasting not doing. Not doing. Yeah, <laughs> right. They sure were. Yeah, so there was naturally, I guess, a, a, you know, a, a basic disagreement. But I think the real threat was in it was in signing players. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I thought I thought David did a very good job of 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 summing up the whole demise of the American Association, which he brings up in the last chapter. You know, and of course, it didn't help matters when some of the teams abandoned ship for the National League which was in stronger financial shape. And then there was a players league, which took away a lot of the good talent. And Nemec mentions, among other factors, the association's failure to replace Denny McKnight with a strong president, uh, allowing Brooklyn and Cincinnati to go to the National League, um, treating Cleveland and Kansas City so poorly, and going along with the unwritten National League rule to ban black players uh, in 1885. And uh, were there any other factors or do you have anybody, anybody have any comments on, on any of these factors or like what was one particularly stronger than the others uh, uh, or were there any other factors that led to the whole disbanding of the American uh, American Association? No, I agree with uh, David Nemec. The number one problem was having a strong president, a strong American Association president to hold the leagues together, to hold the uh, AA together and to avoid the infighting, and they never came up with a strong president to uh, unify the uh, association. Yeah. And it, all the infighting did them in. They actually took yeah. advantage of it. Yeah. That's what I got out of it. I, I think the, the American Association, uh, by and large, had, had had guys that they could just got kind of consensus and he can get enough votes to be, be elected president. But the, the one guy I, I keep coming back to and think about is, is Zach Phelps, uh, oh, yeah. who was a, a not only the uh, owner and sometimes, well, sometimes partial owner of, of the Louisville club, but he was the kind of the war president during the Players, Players League time and then with the battle with the National League in 1891. But Phelps, back to our original point, never really focused so much on keeping the league together as much as he kept a very weak Louisville team as one of the 12 that went mm -hmm. into the, uh, uh, the big league. Um, but I'm, I, I'll go back and say, I think most of the American Association teams just were, did not have the capital and didn't sure. run, run things the way, at least half of the uh, uh, National League did. I remember there were plenty of articles about, you know, if you weren't Chicago, Boston, Baltimore through the 80s and 90s, uh, you didn't win anything. Uh, there was a there was the haves and the haves not in the National League, too. Mm -hmm. Was uh, Opie Kaler disliked a lot? I mean, I, 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 he, he spent a lot of time, he spent a lot of effort, but I guess he's got kind of fed up and just quit and got irritated and everything he was a target a lot of times well, he was because, a target, he, because right. he gave his gave his opinion but he uh. but he was like francis richter even though he was the the journalist he also wanted to own a team uh, yeah. richter put money into some of the philadelphia teams just as kaler did into cincinnati and kaler essentially got I, he didn't get run out of cincinnati but he moved to new york because he just had he, he he couldn't keep things the way he wanted to have them. Mm -hmm. Thought the bigger market would be better for him. Mm -hmm. And 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 Den Den Denny McKnight, and just from the from from, from what I've read about him and other sources, I I wouldn't say he got a a, a raw, raw deal. Maybe he, 
but I, I felt kind of sorry for him, I guess, because I thought he he really tried his first to do a good job, and then uh, and I guess blowing it with that Sam Barkley, and I guess some I think David Nemec says he was very indecisive too, and that's and and that's what a lot of the other owners did not like about him is that uh, he, he couldn't make up his mind about things. He had his own problems at home. Um, uh, the point about these teams not being very very well capitalized was very true of Pittsburgh, and he was constantly having to bring more capital in just to keep afloat. Uh, by the oh. time he relinquished control of the team, um, I think he'd, he he was pretty much finished as a decision maker, even though he stayed on as president of the association for two more years. Yeah. Okay. Dixie, you got something? I do. This is a little bit of a spoiler alert, and I'll be blunt. This book is my favorite book. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I have a thousand books in my little library here. I read this 20 something years ago. I read it because I didn't know jack squat about the about the 19th century, certainly not about the American Association, and I needed someone to tell me about it. So I picked mm -hmm. this book up. I think the way that it is written is these the information that's in it, how it is set up, the photographs, the little side stories, stuff that you can't, I mean, how many times did you say while you were reading this book, if you read it recently, gee, I didn't know that. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. All of the time, David Nemec, to whom I refer to as the Obi-Wan Kenobi of 19th century baseball. <laughs> I mean, he was doing this before the internet became popular and gave us the way to find out how, how much information do we can we find out now in 10 minutes? But he was doing this way back when. I'm looking at two pages here, 228, 229. Here are three pictures, three players who played a tiny bit in the American Association, but became stars in the 1890s in the National League. And mm -hmm. you wouldn't know anything about them about before the 1890s, except for this book. And that's why... This book was my favorite when I turned the last page 20-something years ago. It's my favorite today. And 20 years from now, it's still going to be my favorite book. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Dixie, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell David you said that. Yeah. Well, right <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think I've told him that several times. Yeah. I also, whenever I email him, I started off by saying, Obi-Wan, could you tell me, please? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, Peter, be sure and tell them that we talked about it in our in our book discussion group and everything too. There's a question I'd like to throw out if I can. Um, uh, 1980, I mean, 1884 and 1890 um, were years when there were three leagues, okay, and a lot of disorder. But between those years, it was relative calm between the American and the national. To what extent did the American Association achieved parity with the National League in that period. Any ideas, thoughts on that? I don't think they ever did. Well, I don't know. In the first couple of years of American Association, they were in bigger cities and they outdrew the National League by a considerable amount in 82 and, and 83. But I don't know that they could, uh, the, the, the mindset that I always sense about the owners of the American Association is we're going to, if we have enough money to open the season, we'll let the gate receipts cover all our expenses. Uh, whereas the National League, particularly the, the leading clubs in the, the very big cities, they were trying to make enough money. They put some aside to either build a ballpark, renovate a ballpark, have money for buy players because Boston was able to spend ten thousand dollars to buy uh, what Clarkson and and Kelly uh, mm -hmm. in in the uh, late eighteen eighties when uh, Spalding we got a little disgusted with baseball and wanted to cash in, mm -hmm. but it, you didn't see them offering. There was nobody in the American Association that had that kind of cash laying around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
this is some food for thought. Uh, because we're talking about the American Association here. Who was the very first 19th century baseball overlooked legend in our election of 2009? A first 2009 election. Pete Browning? Who? Pete Browning? Pete, Pete Brown Browning. Browning. Yes. <laughs> Way to go, Mitchell. That's great. Predominantly by, and by I still Lord, think he belongs. By Lord, by he, still belong, he still belongs in the Hall of Fame. He led the Players League in batting. Okay. Is there an American Association player in the Hall of Fame? No, not no, really. Uh, Charlie Comiskey. Although yeah, he was not a, because of oh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Comiskey of but, playing career. Yeah, well, that's because he was a manager, not manager. because he was an owner, not because he was a player. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. No, as as a player, there's a number of guys. Harry Stovey belongs in there. Uh, Bob Carruthers belongs in there. Bob Carruthers is the only pitcher to have ever won more than 200 games and lose less than 100. It's never been done. He's the only one. <clears throat> ever, no one ever I did. Think... No one ever did. No one else ever did it. But isn't it true that a lot of the reason a lot of those guys are not in the Hall of Fame is a presumption that the American Association was lower quality? Yeah, that's the reason. You had to discount their numbers. Well, I also think that by the time you're electing Hall of Famers in the uh, middle to late 30s, American Association had been gone for 35 years. And those players who played the bulk of their career and gathered their statistics, the American Association, weren't remembered that well. And also, uh, we have a hand up here by uh, Paul Langendorfer. But I, one second, Paul, I just want to add that you may see, I'll tell you who has appeared on the uh, pioneers or managers and owners list uh, in the for the Hall of Fame is Chris Bandaa. So you may see Chris Bandaa as the first American Association person, although he did later, uh, you know, come into the National League or the big league, the 12 team and National League and American Association consolidation after 1892. Uh, you may see that Chris Van der Aar is to become maybe the first uh, uh, American Association personality mm. uh, to, to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. Paul, I'm sorry. I, I, you had to is, I still think Pete Browning is probably the strongest candidate of yeah, Pete Browning. Was... He so had was... a lifetime batting average of 3-4-1, <laughs> even if it wasn't inferior league. It wasn't that inferior. And well, he led the Players me. League, which is dominated by National League players, and he led the Players League in hitting in 1890. That shows you the quality of hitter he was. That he right. would have thrived. He would have thrived, maybe not hit 3-4-1, but he still would have hit well over 300 in the National League if he played in the National League and at the National Association, American Association. Indeed, yes, because uh, Browning did, you know, excel in 1890 when he was a Players League player. Yeah. I think these guys still belong in the Hall of Fame, even if the uh, American Association was inferior. <laughs> these guys still belong. The well, endless if, debate. If or, as Peter from... Morris, or as Peter Morris might say, History is told by the victors. That's right. <laughs> and the National League were the victors in this case. Yeah, okay, well. But in the captions in, in David's book, I mean, he'll say something like, in the 19, 1800s, he was the blah, 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 the best, blah, blah, blah. And, and there's so many of those captions like that where he, he singled out these accomplishments for these people. And I thought, and I thought to myself, my God, and none of these people are in the Hall of Fame either. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's 901, everybody. I wanted to keep us on track here. I just thought I'd point that out, but we can keep going if you'd well, like. But I have a really quick question, actually. So, first of all, sorry to keep bouncing in and out of uh, the room. I had a really my internet's not cooperating, so I'm on my phone right now. But my question is actually more for I'm going to throw it out to Dixie, but I'm going to throw it out for the group as well. But Dixie, you said you really like this book quite a bit. Um, I like the sidebars a lot. That was my favorite part of the book. My, I also really the photographs, but to me, the text just didn't do it for me. 
I actually enjoyed Acorn's book, Ed Acorn's uh, the, uh, Summer Beer and Whiskey, a lot more. But I just was curious what your thought was with this book compared to his book, if you've read that book, and why you, why you like this one better. Just a, more of a general question. Well, I haven't read the other one, so I have nothing to compare it to. But as I said, I was reading this 23, 24 years ago when I didn't know anything. And so every sentence was telling me something that I didn't know and that I was interested in. So no, I know it's probably not the world's greatest book in terms of the, the writing style itself. But when you consider the sidebars and the insights that David Nemec gives everybody on just about everything you can imagine in this book, uh, the, the, uh, the prose of it on the pages doesn't matter to me. It's just more information that I can suck up. That's fine. But the little stuff that goes along in this book, considering when he was writing it and how he was able to find out all this information is astounding to me. Oh, I agree with you 100 percent. I love the sidebars. I almost wish there was more of them. And I maybe that's why I like Acorn's book a little more is because he's more of a storyteller and he's uh, he gives you the more of that story. And it's it's also written more from the St. Louis Browns and Vonder Ahi's point of view. But I was just curious. I don't know if anybody else wants to throw their two cents in there. That was my one of the things I was just curious about. Well, I, I will throw in at least a penny and a half. <laughs> the uh, uh, Ed Acorn is a, a Pulitzer Prize winning writer. You know, he he, he that, that's what he did as a profession. Uh, if you look at David Nemec's um, career, it's a very varied career. Um, some of it involved criminal justice. Uh, it's an it's an amazing career, and he is a very prolific writer. And here he is, thirty years later. Contributing to our newsletter, uh, we accepted uh, a, a long version article uh, for our newsletter for the first time in uh, this past October. And uh, Bob uh, placed it in the last uh, pages of the newsletter. So, and you'll see David Nemec's article on two very, very obscure people. And yet, when I read it, I was transfixed. So I think uh, he's gotten, since since uh, when he put this book together, I think he's uh, become a much more powerful writer. And uh, just to uh, give you a just a just a response, Paul, but that's uh, you know mm -hmm. my, my penny and a half. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not slamming the book in any means. It's a phenomenal book. I just I was just more curious than anything else. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, Peter, you mentioned I, I'm a coin collector. You mentioned penny and a half. They made half cents to 1857. <laughs> no, I don't have any. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I collect coins. So they made they actually no, had I'm half sure. cents from 1793 to 1857. So well, you I, said it by then. You could have said you could have said penny and a half. <laughs> well, I think I, I remember a penny. I and don't a half give a farthing. A farthing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a quarter of a penny. <laughs> well everybody thank you very much for all your okay. comments i appreciate it yeah okay this is very enjoyable yeah it was always good enjoyable thank you jack you did a good job on it yeah, thank you with a, with a uh i appreciate a good it. book <laughs> Pretty, yeah thanks everybody i appreciate your again i appreciate your comments and just being here i i enjoy these sessions a great deal Oh, anyway, so I'll see you next time. Uh, you want to wrap things up, Bob or Peter? We have a one one next month, don't we? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bob, we'll wrap that up. Uh, yeah. So let uh, me say that uh, next month, uh, December the sixth, to be precise, uh, we'll have uh, Jim Chulis Chulis. Yeah. Chukolski. <laughs> uh, Chukolski. Right. Chukolski, come back. Uh, and he will be doing Ed Acorn's book uh, about Horse Radburn. And his, uh, his the, the title of the book is uh, uh, 59 in uh, uh, 84, which is... Yeah, I'm about to read that. Know, his 59 I, just, I just pulled that out of my library. I'm going to read it. Yeah. 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 And it's a, I've read the book. It's a, it's a uh, 
it's a you know a very wordy book and i know jim will do a great job with it and that'll be our third and final uh, yeah. uh book club moderation for the this uh fall season uh and then we'll swing into uh uh we and we may be uh uh doing something a little novel <laughs> and it is <laughs> but one of those books in the in the winter season may be a novel yeah yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. well thank you everybody Peace for coming everybody. and thank uh, you. sitting in thank you jack for the sure preparation and leading this uh session and mm -hmm. thanks for everybody who uh who joined in to uh to chat with us tonight uh We'll see you all in December. Please December. remember next Tuesday night is the speaker series with uh, Justin McKinney talking about the 1890 Philadelphia team who started out as a pennant contender and, as he puts it, ended up the worst team in baseball. It should be interesting. It will be okay. interesting, yeah. That sounds like the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> like the Mets. Oh. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good Thank night. You. Thank you, right. everybody. Take care. Take care, everyone. Uh, Bye. Bye. Bye.